What time is it, Chris? Breakfast time. No, try again. Time for lectures. Not yet. Podcast time? It's religious studies project time, which means it must be Monday if you're not aware already. This week, we are delighted to bring you a roundtable discussion, um, which Brad Stoddart recorded for us at the AAR conference recently. Um, And it features... Six scholars who are Rachel Lindsay, Emily Clark, Derek Nelson, M. Cooper Harris, Craig Martin and Finbar Curtis talking about the process of turning your dissertation into your first book. I've done it and I'll have things to say later. Chris is probably thinking about doing it pretty soon. It's supposed to be, yeah. But first, let's hand over to Brad. Hello, this is Brad Stoddard with the Religious Studies Project. Today's podcast features a roundtable discussion with six scholars who address the dissertation to first book process. In addition to introducing their projects, they answer several questions to help graduate students or early career scholars who are either thinking about the dissertation to book process or who maybe are somewhere in the process themselves. Let's start by putting some voices to the names. Will each scholar please introduce yourself and the topic you address in your first book? I'm Rachel Lindsay. I teach at St. Louis University, and my project is A Communion of Shadows, Religion and Photography in 19th Century America. Yes, my name is Cooper Harris. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Religious Studies at Indiana University. And my uh, dissertation book is, is now called Ralph Allison's Invisible Theology. Uh, some version of that has, I think, remained within the title all along. It's, it's had some other versions. Uh, but Ralph Ellison's Invisible Theology. Uh, my name is uh, Craig Martin. I'm an associate professor of religious studies at St. Thomas Aquinas College, which is a small liberal arts school outside New York City. Um, my first book was Masking Hegemony, a Genealogy of... The Genealogy of Religion, Liberalism, and the Private Sphere, or Liberalism, Religion, and the Private... I for, always forget the order, but masking hegemony is what I usually refer to it as. I'm Derek Nelson. I teach religion at Wabash College, and my first book was called What's Wrong with Sin? My name is Emily Suzanne Clark. I'm an assistant professor of religious studies at Gonzaga University. I got my PhD uh, from Florida State University um, in spring of 2014. Um, and my book is A Luminous Brotherhood, Afro-Creole Spiritualism in 19th Century New Orleans. I'm Finbar Curtis. I'm an assistant professor at Georgia Southern University. Um, and the book project is the production of um, American Religious Freedom, which is borrows from, but it's not exactly based on my dissertation, which was called Speaking of the Nation, William James Bryan, Al Smith, and the Idioms of American Populism. Thank you. How would you describe the process of transforming your dissertation into your first book? Um, Long. (laughs) Uh, It's taken me a little bit longer than it has um, some other people. Uh, So it's taken me about four years to get it from the defended dissertation um, into uh, book production. Um, Part of that is because I um, switched jobs a couple of times. Um, But also because, um, you know, the scholarship on visual studies and material cultures of religion um, has grown so much in the last four years. Um, So I really wanted to take the chance to to engage that material. Um, uh, The process um, essentially went um, uh, from defending the dissertation to a period of dormancy uh, for about a year. Um, And then I uh, shopped the proposal to a couple of presses um, and uh, had really good traction with UNC, and that's where I landed the, the contract um, two years ago. Um, and Elaine Mazner, my editor, has been very helpful in um, uh, shaping the final product, product from um, a fairly limited scope dissertation into a much broader cultural history of photography in the 19th century. The, the process for dissertation book for me was largely dictated by by reality. Um, I left Chicago uh, to to take a visiting appointment, um, so the dissertation was largely done and then was submitted. 
uh, but I was still looking for a tenure track job. And one of the things I wanted to be careful of first away, first off, is not to. Uh, I didn't want to get too far beyond the, the dissertation. I wanted to have a book to bring into hopefully a tenure track job. Uh, and so I, I tried to keep, I, I began working on the revision process and I was constantly revising and then I, I had a postdoc at the University of Pittsburgh and again was, uh, was revising and trying to keep it right at the place where I could say it's basically done to go. But as a, as a matter of, as a pragmatic matter, I tried to, to uh, I, I did not immediately go seeking uh, a publisher. Um, I, I tried to hold back. Now, had I gone on much longer, I probably would have gone ahead and, and submitted. But uh, it was about a four-year process for me, sort of between uh, degree and and entering a tenure track job. And so, what I found, fortunately, and I was just describing this to a guy the other day, what I found fortunately was once I entered into the actual uh, job itself, is I basically had it ready to go out. So my dissertation had a lot of material that I cut from the book, in part because a lot of the material in the dissertation was designed for me to respond to the specific, somewhat idiosyncratic requests of the the uh, 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 my committee. Not idiosyncratic in a bad way, but they wanted to push me on some things that they wanted me to demonstrate my knowledge, but those things just didn't need to go into the book. Also, who needs 100 pages on John Rawls? <laughs> um, so uh, when I finished my dissertation, I had recommendations for, for how to improve it. And I had sent out a couple of the chapters as independent articles. And one of the most substantial revisions was actually from, uh, I got a revise and resubmit saying, you should do all these things to this article. And... Uh, it ended up being rejected, but I actually, uh, those were some of the most substantial revisions to that chapter based on the journal editor's requests. Um, so I cut material, I substantially revised that, and I, I think the, the biggest change was revising the introduction and conclusion to frame the book in a different way. So that the way that I framed it when I wrote my prospectus was to ask a certain type of question about the material. But then when I turned it into a book, I had a kind of different question because my after the research, some clarity came about and I realized it was a different question I wanted to ask about the same material. And the chapters remained mostly the same, but I framed it differently. So it, it uh, with, you know, with a different frame, it's a different book. So I, I think, yeah, cutting, adding, uh, historical detail of substance and then changing the frame and the intro to conclusion were the main main changes that I made to the book. I was very sick of my dissertation by the time I got to the end of the process and so I just let it sit for a while. I debated rewriting from scratch uh, for a wider audience than the four people whom I uh, wrote the dissertation for. Um, I started to think about publishing some of the chapters as articles or spin-offs but then ended up sending it to a German press um, for the kind of rigorous, substantive thing. Uh, but then I realized that they, most of their books were 250 bucks a piece, and they wanted uh, more revision than I was willing to put in. And so I went with a, a press that I realized appeared in my footnotes a lot, and thus had a lot of overlap with the kinds of things I was interested in and sent it to them, and they loved it. Yeah, well, my process is sort of a negative example of things not to do, which is, uh, although it might also be something that reflects even just the change over time. So when I was writing my dissertation in graduate school, dissertation was a place to experiment, think about new ideas, you know, um, I, and I was particularly interested in thinking about new ways of talking about populism. Um, and I had a set of social theories that were involved with that. Um, I, you know, my advisor was Kathy Albanese, who sort of disciplined me on history, or at least tried to. And um, and then I had Roger Friedland as a social theorist, and um, Giles Gunn as a literary critic, and Wade Clark Roof as a sociologist. And so I was really shooting for something interdisciplinary. And I really wasn't thinking in practical terms about how this was going to become a book. I was just kind of working through ideas and... Um, and so once I got out and hit the job market, 
Um, I was publishing articles and I sort of was thinking about the book, but in my mind and really in my advisor's mind, the process was you go through, you get your PhD, you get a job, and then you take five years, you know, three years and rework your dissertation into a book. Um, and so I just found myself in contingent faculty world um, with very heavy teaching loads and on the job market applying for jobs. And so it's frankly hard to work on the book. And so um, what I ended up doing is I basically at some point when I was, it was just actually when this, I was driving along to University of Alabama where I was teaching at the time. And I was spending a lot of time trying to think about how to take this kind of dense social theory that I was thinking about in American populism and make that a readable book. You know, so part of it was just market. And at some point I just said, screw it. You know, I'm, I had written this piece on intelligent design that had to do with questions of freedom. Um, I had written, uh, I was working on this Charles Grandison Finney piece for a, another conference paper I was giving. Uh, I had a Al Smith piece that was a spinoff of a dissertation um, that I, it was kind of a standalone piece. It was actually very different from the way the dissertation was structured. Um, and I was working on another standalone piece on William Jennings Bryan. And I said, you know what, why don't I just take those? Uh, I had written a paper in Louisa May Alcott in grad school, a paper on Malcolm X in grad school. I was kind of interested in the tea party then. And I was like, I'll just do a bunch of essays on religious freedom. And that'll be the book. Um, and I was already in conversation at that point with Jennifer Hammer at NYU Press uh, about transferring the dissertation to a book. And, um, and we were sort of going back and forth on that. And then I said, actually, I have this new idea. Um, and she liked that. And she said, that's great. You should do that. And that's kind of how the, that, that created this new idea for a book. Um, so it's really kind of a arbitrary contingent process. And it was very much a, a creation of the fact that I was a contingent faculty member who had to kind of smush some things together. And at that point, too, I'd sort of given up on the job market. So I was just sort of saying, I'd like to write a book and then move on with my life. I'd been on the job market for like six or seven years at, the, at that time. Um, and so this book is probably not a book I would have written had I followed that model of getting a PhD, you know, and then start, I would have written that book on populism and it would have been more of a coherent monograph in some ways. But um, in a way, this was kind of a, a product of that necessity of invention. You know, I needed something I could get done, that I had some material, and that would be a little more accessible book on freedom. Um, you know, it's time consuming. Um, it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of thinking. Um, and it takes a lot of copy paste, move around. Um, read, see how that works, and then move something around again. Um, so for me, it was, it was just a lot of reorganizing. How did you find the publisher that published your first book? I really wanted a press that took my work seriously, not only as a scholar of religion, but as a, a historian of the United States. Um, so I looked very closely at presses that um, had strong lists in both U.S. history and, uh, and, and religion. Uh, UNC was, in, was like, in, at the top of that list, so I'm very fortunate that, that they found the book um, and uh, that the, they welcomed the book as well. Um, did you reach out to them? What? Did, like, did you cold call, basically? I basically cold called, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, uh, before AAR, I, in, uh, I guess, 2013, um, I uh, reached out to Aline and said, hey, I'm going to be at AAR. Would you want to take a look at this? Uh, proposal, and she said, "Yeah." So we met uh, very briefly in the UNC booth for ten minutes that November, and then uh, followed up a, f a few weeks later. Um, and she really helped me think about the proposal, the book proposal, as a new kind of document. This wasn't just the abstract of the dissertation. This was um, really the, the the gate to the new project. Um, so she walked me through that process. It was very helpful. And just a publisher uh, for me came, actually, I, I was interested in the NYU series, the North American Religion series that this book will come out in. All along, um, I met, for the first time, Tracy Fessenden at a symposium in Syracuse that turned into, a, um, that turned into a, an edited volume, uh, Race and Secularism in America, uh, edited by Jonathan Kahneman and Lloyd. Uh, 
she was there, she heard that paper, and then she was writing the afterword and, and just wrote an email saying, hey, I, I, I like this, and I said, hey, funny, you uh, should say that. Uh, I have this book proposal I'd love to, to show you. And so I sent it to her, and that got uh, things in, in motion. So, uh, well, first I sent out lots of uh, book proposals to all the top presses, and none of them bit. So I uh, reached out to a series editor for a, a book series, and I had a prior rapport with the series editor, it's Russell McCutcheon, um, and uh, he thought that my book would be quite possibly a good fit for his series and and he was like absolutely send me a book proposal actually what he said was you should send your book proposal to the most elite publishers first and I did that and got rejected and then so I sent it to Russ's <laughs> series which I think is a really good series but as far as uh, uh, you know getting a job or tenure and promotion something like Oxford University Press would be more advantageous but Alas, but uh, so so it was through identifying a book series editor that I thought would be sympathetic to the project. So my dissertation advisor suggested the press, uh, the German press. Um, it's uh, can I say it? On tape, Van der Hoek and Ruprecht, which is so fun to say. Uh, but as I said, their books were so expensive. The the review was positive and really helpful. Like I learned a lot from their ex, from their external reviewer, um, but just just cold called uh, TNT Clark, just sent them an email saying, I think I did not tell them that it was a dissertation. I think I told them what the idea was, what the book idea was, and how it was a kind of contemporary critique of traditional Protestant theology, which they're good at doing, traditional Protestant theology. So I tried to work the angle of. Um, this is in keeping of, with what you've been doing, but it's a kind of newer, cutting edge, dare I say, take on it. So I put together a book proposal, which I asked a couple of friends who had already published their first books for their book proposal to see what it looked like. And I sent that to three different publishers, uh, two of which were not interested, one of which was. You know, it started out by uh, Laura Levitt, who's one of the series editors, walked up to me and said, you should be in our series. Um, and that, so it wasn't, wasn't a whole lot of initiative on my part. Um, and um, and that was, yeah, so David Watt, Laura Levitt, and, and Tracy Fessenden had this series that they were creating. Um, and she thought I should be in it. And so that started that conversation process. And originally, we were going back and forth about making the dissertation into the book. Um, and um, And I think Jennifer's editorial input is she was thinking about markets being practical and making something more accessible, something that undergrads could read. And a lot of what I was writing might not fit that, you know, it was a little denser. Um, and so those were some of her concerns. And so I think NYU in particular wanted something that could be read by Americanists. And that was kind of how, uh, when I reimagined this religious freedom book, it was sort of response to those, those editorial, that editorial guidance. To what extent did the editor and publisher influence the final draft? Elaine, in particular, um, she, I mean, it, it's a really unique sort of relationship, right? Because uh, they certainly respect um, the authorial integrity, my authorial integrity. Um, this is the story that I'm telling. Um, but she does have a very keen sense of, um, you know, what is the big story here? You know, you want to speak beyond, uh, you know, the, the people who are going to attend the conferences and listen to your 15-minute your presentation. Um, so she was really helpful in um, helping me hone the, the so what question um, beyond sort of what does this mean for the study of religion into um, how is the community of shadows really part of American history? Uh, and that had been there all along, sort of under the surface, and she really through through conversations with her, she really helped me bring that up into essentially the organizing thematic of the book. I've found that I've been able to go largely my own way uh, with this project. Uh, Jennifer Hammer and, and other folks at NYU have certainly made very good suggestions um, that I've followed, but it's, it's not been largely managed or controlled. Now, some of this is because I was tinkering on it for several years before 
I send it in. So it's not like I was sending them drafts hot off the um, hot off the computer. But um, I, I think because I had been revising and rewriting it for so long, it it probably came to them more of a finished product. Um, that uh, so it wasn't quite as necessary. They let me do what I wanted to do, which was great. They uh, the team was very good to work with. Um, they copy edited it pretty well. They um, didn't ask for substantial revisions except to the introduction. There was a little bit of wrangling between the, the like the subheadings, how how um, narrow I could get when dividing up the chapters so they weren't just really really long. Um, and that was good. The finished product, I had no say in the design, the cover, uh, a little bit, I guess, in the title. So I had pretty, um, pretty good autonomy, but also support for the, for the meat of it. Uh, this I've written now ten books. I haven't gotten to pick the cover of any of them. So I'm really mad about that. <laughs> Not a whole lot. Um, I was quite lucky, and the two reviewers of the manuscript didn't suggest a whole lot of revising, and so my editor, uh, for the most part, put the ball in my court in terms of what I wanted to do, what I wanted to change up, um, how much I wanted to shift things around. Um, so not overly involved, and um, really let the, the book be mine, and acted more as a champion and an advocate for the process, or for the project. I mean, a lot, you know, because I, I think actually if it wasn't for the editor, I don't know if I would have conceptualized this project because it was um, it was my attempt to respond to the broader editorial concerns about the lack of accessibility of the project that I was working on. Um, and so I was thinking, all right, well, here's a here's a kind of practical response. I think it would be hard for me to do what I want to do with, with, on – American populism. And there's still some traces of that in this book. So for example, the chapter on D.W. Griffith is probably the densest. Um, it's the one that engages people like Ernesto Laclau and Giorgio Agamben. And in a way, that was going to be the book. You know, it was going to be a book on populism that engaged those sets of social theories. And so it's still there. And it, it, the way you can kind of read the book is you might just gloss over what's going on in this fourth chapter and just skip to the fifth. And it's fine. You could read the book like that. Um, but it was, and, and so it was in response to those editorial concerns that I wrote other much more readable chapters. So I think like my Malcolm X chapter is much more readable. And that was really written after the book already had a contract. Because I, I really ended up scrapping that old grad student paper I'd written and, and wrote something from scratch. And for my final question, what do you now know about the dissertation to first book process that you wish you had known at the beginning of the process? I wish that I had been more confident in myself. Like it took me a long time to really trust my own voice um, and to um, trust my instincts as a, as a researcher and as a storyteller. And I think that that's probably what sort of kept me from really digging into the revisions earlier. It wasn't so much, I mean, I can say that I was moving around from school to school, that I had teaching and kids and all that stuff. But I think part of it was really uh, learning to trust myself. And uh, uh, my editor was really helpful in instilling confidence and colleagues along the way as well. So Good. You know, I think that's probably what well, I wish I had. Uh, I mean, my advice would be that, that you know, if you have... Once, once you reach a point where you think you have the, the project well in hand, go ahead and start getting it out there. Start talking to editors. Start sending the, the proposal out and around. Uh, also, uh, take uh, use uh, the, the leadership or mentor people in your life as, uh, uh, for, for advice. They've gone through this. Uh, there are good books that are handy, but you really don't it's it's not a, necessarily always an intuitive process, so don't be afraid to ask for help or for advice, but also don't be afraid just to go ahead and put yourself out there and get it going. I th so, I, and I guess I kind of knew this, because somebody told me this when I was working on my dissertation. Somebody told me, this is the hardest thing you'll do in your career, um, because the expectations for peer reviewers from a press are less intrusive perhaps than the 
the people on your dissertation committee. Um, I'm not sure if that's completely true, but it it it's pretty close if it's not completely true. The other thing about finding a book is that you you have to find you have to find a uh, interested press, and if you don't find an interested press you're out of luck. But because I was able to find an interested press, uh, preparing the book for publication was easier than preparing the dissertation for my defense. Uh, yeah, because because the you know, dissertation committee members are, are hard, which is their job to push you. Uh, but I've always found peer reviewers for other book proposals to be less intrusive on my project than, than my committee members. Again, I think that's a good thing. But it's it's a uh, future things in my career have not been as stressful as that was. I wish I had taken more time to really redraft portions of the of the book. But frankly, I was so sick of it that I wanted to just get it out there. And in my case, the the book was about you know social sin. It was a pretty heady you know dissertation level kind of thing. But the press that published it has the series guides for the perplexed. And so I was, because I got the, the first book done and out, they asked me to write the guide for the perplexed on the doctrine of sin. And so there, that was starting from scratch in a sense, but it built on all this research that I'd done. And that was really truly my own book. I really feel good about how that one came. So getting the first one out there, even though I wasn't thrilled with how it went, got my foot in the door and got me the credibility to then launch into the next topic which was related so that's something to think about if you're going to write more than one book the first book doesn't have to be amazing you can find your you can use it to find your way you, you want to still be proud of it of course uh, and have it be a genuine contribution not just something on your on your CV but don't put too much stock in this has to be the magnum opus one thing that I wish I knew uh, sooner was every publisher has their own stylistic guidelines that they want you to follow, and I wish I had found those sooner after I uh, went under contract with University of North Carolina Press, um, because I went through at least one more revision, um, and I could have started putting things more in the stylistic guidelines that they want instead of having to really hustle down and do that. Um, kind of all together with um, a final copy editing process. I have very complex, ambivalent feelings about that question because on one hand, and I don't know what the word for this is, but there's something about that that I, I kind of like the process, even though it destroyed my life for eight years. Um, I like that it, um, I kind of like where this book ended up and I probably couldn't have written that book unless I had taken that very kind of experimental approach to writing a dissertation. So, you know, and I think that was true of a lot of us at Santa Barbara at the time, you know, so I was a couple years behind John Modern and, you know, his book is not his dissertation. His book is this crazy thing. Or the dissertation is this crazy thing that's sitting in the, you know, Davidson Library at UCSB. And the book, I guess the book's kind of crazy too, but in a different way, a more, more publishable way. Um, same with like Kerry Mitchell. I mean, the, the actual dissertation that he wrote is very different from the book that he wrote. Um, and, um, and so I liked that I used my dissertation as a way to kind of think about new ways of inventing religious studies in the United States. Um, but that wasn't very practical. So I don't know what I would say. A lot of times the, the advice that I would give about doing interesting things in academia is very different from the practical advice about how to get a job. So, um, I would have had to be a very different person to take the advice I would give now, which is the more practical advice I think that anybody would give, which is, you know, be a little more modest and realistic about what you can accomplish um, and think about a book market. But I just didn't think about that at all. I just thought about the stuff that I was interested in. So the advice I would give is just don't talk to Finbar Curtis. He has no idea and he can't really give you any meaningful guidance about how to actually navigate the, the book market. Just talk to other people. And with that, we'll go ahead and end this discussion. First and foremost, thanks to everyone who participated, and we hope the listeners learned something about the important dissertation to first book process. Thanks. Thanks very much for that entertaining and informative discussion, everyone. Um, yes, as we were saying beforehand, this is something 
very much weighing on my mind at the moment, the sort of pressure of how quickly do you need to do it and how does one do it when you've not really got very much spare time. Um, so yes, yeah, so that was very useful and I'll certainly be returning to that podcast mm. in six months. Yeah, when I'm actually thinking properly about it. It's actually, it's a very serious issue. You, the, um, it's probably the time in your career that you have the most time. But in fact, you're actually probably working a part-time job or some sort of, you know, low-paid kind of research assistant or, uh, you know, like we do tutoring, which is um, a lot more work than what you're actually paid for. Mm-hmm. Um and so whilst the pressure is on you to publish or perish, um, and it seems like you've got all this time and this body of research to turn into books, um, the reality of it is is not that simple. Exactly. And and then if you are lucky enough to get a, a position um, and you know start on a, a postdoc research project or a, a lectureship or something, once you've started that, where's the time? to be working on this monograph, you know, you're going to be having to work on the next thing. So it could quite yep. easily fall by the way. So. And attention, of course, if you start a new research project, um, your head and your heart are going to be with that one rather than revisiting mm-hmm. stuff that you've already killed yourself for four years with. Yeah. So really grateful to have had that discussion on here. Um, how did you find it, David? What was your process? Um, my process was to have thought about it being a book from the day I started writing it Um, and it was commented upon at the time that it read more like a book than um, some other people's thesis did Mm. Um, but that's I would like to say that that was me being sort of headstrong and willful but I'll put it down just to laziness (laughs) (laughs) I don't think laziness is something that um, could be be thrown at you Um, so um, we're fully in the swing of things here. We've got a whole host of uh, interviews recorded at the moment. They're flying in thick and fast, which is really exciting. Um, but next week, um, we've got an interview conducted by our very own Kritika Batatarji, or Batacharji, or how many different pronunciations did we're you ju- We're just saying Kritika B. Kritika B. Batacharji. Um, next week and she's been speaking with christopher harding on religion and the psi disciplines um so you know we get a lot of certainly um psychology of religion um podcasts on the rsp so this will be uh, an interesting um sort of more meta approach to psi disciplines in general psi indeed and um bit of a focus on japan as well here which is 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 good we don't get enough uh, from uh, the east Um, We talk about orientalization a lot, but we don't have much about the Orient, unfortunately. Um, Although we are uh, working behind the scenes to improve that. Yeah, yeah. And some of the uh, podcasts that are coming up um, will all be addressing some of that gap. It's great. Um, And uh, I know that David and I are going to be at an event. um, Ooh, when is it? In June? In June, Um, yes. um, When there's hopefully going to be an opportunity to get quite a few more podcasts that'll, again, address that uh, that gap. Yes, Um, exciting times indeed. Uh, This traditionally has been the time of the year that uh, the RSP has tended to slow down, and it's wonderful to see, um, if anything, we're picking up pace, and the whole team is doing sterling job. Uh, So we're very excited. So come back um, next week for that podcast. And as ever, in between times, you can check out our Facebook page, Twitter, Google+, YouTube, find us on iTunes, or send us an email or leave a comment on the website. Um, uh, Response to one of the podcasts uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, provoked uh, a bit of uh, heated debate in the comment section on the site. And that's exactly what we want to be happening Uh, if you if you react positively, negatively, indifferently, let us know. Start the debate. We like to think of ourselves as the, the virtual seminar room. I think so. And if you have anything more uh, directly aimed at us, any suggestions for the site, anything you'd like to see, anything you'd like to volunteer yourself for, um, get in touch with us at editors at religiousstudiesproject dot com. But for now, thanks so much for listening.